here today is my son, Lawrence. He graduated from the University of Montevallo and then got his master's at Utah State University and his PhD at UCLA. And then he, they hired him to teach back at Utah State where he had gotten his master's and he, he teaches American history and it sort of specializes in environmental and urban history. And he'll be talking about some of that, I'm sure, today. So anyhow, uh, I'll let him do the talking. <laughs> well, hi, everybody. It's wonderful to uh, join you all today. Uh, let's see if I can share my screen here. Do, 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 do. All right. I haven't gone into slideshow mode yet, but hopefully... Everybody can see an opening title screen and can see and can hear me, I hope. Uh, if anybody can, yeah, please yeah. let me know. Yeah, it's good. It's good. All right. All right. Well, then we'll we'll get rolling. Uh, thank you all for, for having me here today. I'm very happy to join you and to uh, have a chance to talk about uh, some things related to my research. This is actually... Uh, uh, an adapted version of a talk I would give in my big survey class, my U.S. history survey class. I usually teach the second half of it from the Civil War to the present. And uh, when you're teaching a huge course like that, you have to sort of compress everything down and figure out what big themes you want to talk about and um, uh, what major events. And um, when we get into the post-World War II period, we sort of roll through the 1950s and then get into the 1960s. And so for a number of years now, I've done a lecture on three women who wrote three hugely influential books at the beginning of the 1960s. Um, Jane Jacobs wrote uh, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, which was published in 1961. Rachel Carson wrote uh, Silent Spring in 1962. And Betty Friedan wrote uh, The Feminine Mystique in 1963. So uh, uh, this this lecture topic does a couple different things. It sets up a whole bunch of things we're going to be talking about in the latter portion of that course. Um, the multiple civil rights movements, uh, the environmental movement, the new women's movement, uh, the new conservative movement, which in part was a reaction against the women's movement and other movements of the 1960s. Um, it's a way to talk about big demographic changes in the United States, the Sun Belt migration and the migration to suburbia, uh, and the sort of priorities of a post-war affluent country. Um, and then for a very different reason, quite frankly, in that course, uh, the students have heard from and about a whole lot of men for quite a while. Uh, so it's nice to to um bring three very important female voices back in and let them sort of introduce students a whole lot of things we'll be thinking about later in the course uh, a couple of these authors also tie directly to some of my research interests especially jane jacobs and urban history as we'll see and rachel carson and environmental history as we'll see so with that uh with that sort of background introduction on where how this lecture works in my class uh, we'll go ahead and get into it. Um, so let's talk about Jane Jacobs, Rachel Carson, and Betty Friedan, and these three hugely important books that all emerge uh, at the beginning of the 1960s. So we'll start uh, just thinking a little bit about these are uh, uh, how these women are connected, even though they had very different concerns and were writing independently of each other. Uh, they were all critiquing in different ways a post-war society that was dominated by male professionals and who argued for reform of various kinds, uh, that all the major professions, even though there had been progress in a lot of ways, the major professions, medicine and law and politics and architecture and major fields in education and especially the sciences were still very heavily uh, male dominated in this era. Uh, despite the progress of the, the preceding decades. Um, so let's let's start with uh, uh, one of these people, Jane Jacobs and her critique of post-war urban planning and redevelopment. So Jane Jacobs is not someone with a background in urban planning or architecture or anything like that. Uh, um, 
she had uh, more of a kind of a journalism background, but she mainly was just someone who lived in a big city. She lived in New York City, specifically in Greenwich Village. And she was incredibly dubious about what she saw as major transformations happening in American cities in the post-war era, in the 1950s and early 1960s. Um, she was especially concerned about urban planners who were doing these huge post-war transformations of urban life, blasting freeways through neighborhoods, building huge public housing projects, um, uh, remaking whole neighborhoods, um, as some later urban planners say, it was sort of like they were looking at a map from 30,000 feet and making these huge choices about what was going on in cities in the post-war era. Um, they were, these urban planners were responding to something that was pretty obvious. Uh, in the second half of the 20th century, you see this mass movement out of central cities into suburbia and from the so-called Rust Belt, older cities of the Northeast to the Sun Belt cities of the South and Southwest. Uh, and they were responding to this loss in population. There were larger structural forces at work, especially, especially things like the federal housing, FHA loans that made it possible for people to buy houses in suburbia. Um, uh, and so they're moving out of central cities and moving to where jobs are, where the weather is better. So I just, as a brief example here, and I don't know if you can, if our dialogue boxes are blocking the other half of the screen or not. Um, but basically, everywhere in green exploded in population between 1950 and the 1990s, and everywhere in red had the reverse experience, it shrank in population. So Mesa, Arizona, a minor suburb of Phoenix, uh, is going to become a big city in its own right. Uh, Phoenix, at, on the eve of World War II, was a place of about 50,000 people. Uh, by the census of 2010, it's the fifth largest city in the United States. So that's an example of massive growth. Places like Buffalo, places like Louisville, places like St. Louis, all lost a lot of population in the same era, in part to suburban sprawl, in part to people moving away to Sunbelt cities. Meanwhile, places like Anaheim, places like Sacramento, places like San Jose explode in population, um, while places like Baltimore and Detroit shrink. You know, Detroit loses basically half of its population um, St. Louis also has a very large population drop. Um, I think one of the more telling aspects of recent census data was, I think it was the census of 2010, when San Jose replaced Detroit as the 10th largest city in the United States, which gives you some sense of how, how much the economy had changed, how much the demography of the country had changed uh, since the industrial heyday of the country uh, before and during World War II. So the urban planners are responding to this loss of population, to poor housing stock, to entrenched poverty, to other problems, but their solutions were uh, kind of big, blunt efforts to impose change from above without thinking much about how people actually lived in these places or what they wanted from them. So just as one example, the question of public housing, which is an issue not just in the US, but also in Europe and Asia in the post-war era, the United States comes out of World War II largely unscathed. Of course, many parts of Europe do not. I think, for example, in Berlin and Warsaw, 90% of the structures were destroyed during the war. So everything's having to be rebuilt. Um, so here is an example of uh, big architects and big architecture at their most extreme. This was Le Cabousier, a famous Swiss and French architect. His plan for post-war Paris, uh, just a giant pile of huge international style housing uh, skyscrapers. Thankfully, this does not get built in central palace, Paris, although structures like this do go up in the suburbs of Paris um, and in a lot of other big European cities. Um, and the U.S. does it to a lesser degree. The U.S. never builds nearly as much public housing as countries in Western Europe do or Eastern Europe. Um, but I can give you just one example. Uh, this was a big housing, public housing project development in Chicago called Cabrini Green. So this was a neighborhood that was not doing great before all this was built. It had some poverty, fairly high unemployment. 
um, kind of standard issues of crime. So the solution from the big urban planners was to basically demolish the neighborhood, this predominantly African-American working class neighborhood, and replace it with high rise towers. Um, you can argue about whether or not that was a good idea to begin with, that if you're demolishing an existing community and streetscape and building an all new place, whether or not that will somehow magically transform all the problems of a community where those problems are entrenched in long-term unemployment and things like that. Um, but that was exacerbated by other problems. So in the U.S. in particular, these large housing structures get built, and then that's kind of it. They're not well-maintained. They have plumbing problems and electrical problems, and the elevators stop working, which is a huge problem for anybody with mobility issues. So these become, over a few decades, um, frankly, unloved, unhappy uh, places full of people who are not doing great, who don't really like these places, the older problems of the communities did not go away. In fact, they got worse uh, in terms of unemployment and poverty and stuff like that. Um, so in the case of Cabrini Green, and here we're, I'm leaping ahead of Jane Jacobs. We're going to get to her critique in just a minute. But what happens in Chicago is ultimately uh, this whole complex is going to be torn down and replaced with a mixed-use neighborhood. This was a plan for what it was going to look like. Um, this mixed-use neighborhood uh ironically enough looks a lot like the original neighborhood looks like what this place was originally when it was basically smaller houses and small apartment buildings with stores and shops and things mixed in um so you see this this sort of headlong dive into public housing and then sort of a retreat from it you can see that in birmingham too uh there was a large housing project just uh east of downtown Birmingham that was then torn down and replaced with mixed-use housing. There are problems with mixed-use housing, too, especially in terms of affordability. But the, the urban planners sort of took a step back from this huge-scale redevelopment of neighborhoods to something that looked a little bit more like older organic neighborhoods. And that's going to get to the critique that Jane Jacobs was focusing on. Um, so a couple other examples of this big redevelopment before we talk about Jane Jacobs. So this is all the stuff that's going on in the in the 50s. Uh, a huge freeway system was built in the United States in the post-war era. Uh, this involves, on the one hand, connecting rural communities, but on the other hand, blasting through existing cities and building these huge new roadways. Um, let me give you just one example, one place. Uh, this is Flint, Michigan. Uh, Flint uh, was for decades associated with GM and specifically with Buick. And GM told the city leaders in Flint that they needed freeway access for their huge Buick factory called Buick City. So city leaders in Flint went along with this plan to blast, as you can see, these freeways through Flint. In the process, they destroyed multiple African-American neighborhoods, working class and middle class. Uh, all in the name of traffic flow, all in the name of allowing supplies to get to Buick City. Um, this is a huge factory. This is what it looked like in the 1980s. Uh, unfortunately, this is what Buick City looked like by the early 21st century. Uh, so the, the city basically allowed this massive redevelopment project all in the name of progress. And then a few decades later, the whole reason for it was gone as was the city's tax base. Um, and Flint has had lots of other problems since then. But this, again, was a case where the planners are sort of getting what they wanted in the name of progress and, and movement uh, at the expense of existing communities. And then, again, as a critique, we'll see Jane Jacobs make. Uh, one other example from a different part of the country uh, Seattle was a place that was booming in the post-war era. Seattle was once a blue-collar town centered around salmon canneries and, and timber. But in the post-war era, as the headquarters for Boeing, it had become a booming place, maybe not in the Sun Belt technically because of its rainy weather, but still a place that was growing very rapidly in the post-war era. So it was not experiencing this kind of loss of population population 
or entrenched uh, poverty. And yet, even in Seattle, you see this fairly big redevelopment project that demolishes an existing neighborhood. Seattle did not have a large African-American community, uh, but it did have one sizable, specific African-American neighborhood near downtown. And that neighborhood was leveled to build the 1962 World's Fair in Seattle. And that World's Fair was all about, and there's, of course, the famous monument from it, the, the Space Needle. Uh, the, the 1962 World's Fair in Seattle was all about Seattle establishing itself as an aerospace city, um, a city of the future and high technology, no longer a blue-collar resource extraction place. Um, but in order to do that, they, again, demolished an existing neighborhood uh, to build all this and to put in the, the, the monorail and other things. Um, and again, you see whose priorities are, are winning here and whose are not. Um, uh, some people, some priorities, some neighborhoods, some businesses are more important than others. Uh, and you see that play out in Seattle too. So that gets us to New York, uh, to the biggest city in the country, the biggest fight over urban redevelopment in some ways in the country. And that comes down to a fight between someone who was hugely famous and someone who was not, uh, Robert Moses and Jane Jacobs and their fight over the future of New York. So Robert Moses was the most powerful planner in America. He had an incredible amount of power in ways that are almost unthinkable now. He could basically approve projects by himself uh, get them built without having to go through any kind of community feedback or environmental impact statements or anything like that. You could just sort of, you know, look at a map of the city and say, I want the freeway to go here, and thus it would happen. He was responsible for some huge projects uh, that New Yorkers use, infrastructure projects, freeway projects. Um, and he really prioritized the concerns of big office building owners downtown in Manhattan and their workers. So his whole goal was to make New York a place that was easy to commute in and out of. And freeways were of course the central part of that. And building all those freeways in a dense city like New York involved destroying of course a huge amount of housing, a huge amount of neighborhoods to build all this stuff. Um, so he builds all kinds of things, the Triborough Bridge and, and all kinds of stuff that New Yorkers use uh, to this day. Um, but he uh, uh, also, uh, unfortunately, sort of baked into his designs uh, some pretty negative things. Um, he, again, he really prioritized what was best for big downtown office building owners for workers commuting in and out of the city and not so much for anybody else. Uh, he didn't really think it was important, for example, that working class people in the city could get out of the city if they wanted to go to the beach or something. He didn't really prioritize transportation like that. He was, trans he was prioritizing transportation one way for one subset of people, for one economic activity. And that is what Jane Jacobs critiqued. So she, like I said, lived in New York, lived in Greenwich Village, uh, Greenwich Village was this sort of, in the early 1960s, was this sort of hippie bohemian neighborhood. I'll come back to her book ad in a minute there. So this is Washington Square in Greenwich Village. It's still there today. Um, it was in the 1950s, a neighborhood where like Jack Kerouac and Bob Dylan and, and Jackson Pollock and all these um, 1950s, 90, 1960s beat and countercultural folks and folk singers and important artists and writers lived in a alien universe where writers and artists could live in New York City. Uh, no longer with us, of course. So uh, Robert Moses wanted to build a freeway right through Greenwich Village, uh, right through the middle of this neighborhood. And this infuriated Jane Jacobs not to, not just to the point that she wanted to protest it or argue against it, but she wrote a whole book about it. And that book was The Death and Life of Great American Cities. Uh, in this book, she, which is a broadside against urban planning as it was practiced in the mid 20th century, she said the city planners are ravaging our cities. 
Uh, they put up gleaming stone and glass file cabinet housing, which breeds delinquency and crime. Um, they've built spacious green park areas that are avoided by everyone but bums and hoodlums. Uh, they've condemned and destroyed entire city blocks that are not slums, but often attractive places to live. They've zoned our cities into intolerable patterns of dullness. So those were fighting words aimed at the heart of a profession that, again, was dominated by men who were doing these huge projects in the post-war era. She argued that these guys were looking at cities from 30,000 feet, and they weren't thinking about how cities actually worked and how people actually lived in them and how difficult it is to create an organic sense of community and how easy it is to destroy it. And that that's what these guys were doing. So she takes on uh, Robert Moses. One of one of her many points of critique are those huge public housing projects. Um, so I'll read just a little snippet here. In New York's East Harlem, there's a housing project with a conspicuous rectangular lawn, which became lawn, which became an object of hatred to the project tenants. Uh, and so one tenant finally tells a social worker why they didn't like it and why they don't like this whole neighborhood. As this tenant says, nobody cared what we wanted when they built this place. They threw our houses down and pushed us here and pushed our friends somewhere else. We don't have a place around here to get a cup of coffee or a newspaper even, or borrow 50 cents. Nobody cared what we need. But the big men come and look at that grass, that patch of unloved, unused grass in the middle of a bunch of high-rise towers and say, isn't it wonderful? Now the poor have everything. Uh, this tenant was saying what moralists have said for thousands of years, handsome is as handsome does. All that glitters is not gold. Um, uh, she was saying more. There's a quality even meaner than outright ugliness or disorder. And this meaner quality is the dishonest mask of pretended order achieved by ignoring or suppressing the real order that is struggling to exist and be served. So her, her main complaint here is that these huge urban planning projects didn't think about ordinary people, didn't think about ordinary communities. Uh, Robert Moses, not surprisingly, hated her book uh, and infamously said that when he looked at her book, he said that she looked at cities like a housewife. Um, the subtext being, of course, that housewives, that wives and mothers had nothing of value to say about cities. Um, and she, needless to say, did not think that. Um, ironically, this person who was not an urban planner, her book became standard reading in urban planning classes. When I teach my urban history course, students read a nice chunk of it uh, to get a sense about what all she's arguing. And it's a really sophisticated argument that you can't just magically transform whole neighborhoods and communities just by building some giant buildings or blasting through a freeway. Um, that you needed to think about how these communities actually worked, how people related to them, what they wanted out of them, uh, which, of course, takes time to actually think about all that. And that was not where urban planning was in the 1950s and 1960s. And I think to, to wrap up our discussion of Jane Jacobs, in some ways, she is even more relevant right now, uh, four years after COVID completely transformed how we work and how we do or do not commute to work and how much we do or do not need to use office space. Because again, one of her arguments was that you people, you planners are prioritizing one kind of economic activity, office workers who commute into the city and leave and occupy these big office buildings. You're not thinking about any other kind of economic activity. And a viable downtown needs to have office workers and residents and restaurants and stores and public services, and that a more diverse downtown community, a more diverse downtown economy will be much more resilient and do much better in the longer term. And so, you know, one of the things that's happened post COVID is a whole lot of that super expensive downtown real estate is not as occupied as it used to be. Um, and it's sort of hilarious, the New York Times invariably every week or two does some big article about, well, no one think of the billionaire real estate developers and their, their tragic plight because their office buildings aren't as occupied as they used to be. And even Manhattan, which of course is this hugely lively, wealthy place, uh, is having trouble with business occupancy 
And so I think Jane Jacobs, many, many decades after her book was written, is once again having the last laugh. So that's Jane Jacobs and urban reform. Uh, let's talk next about uh, Rachel Carson, uh, the fight against DDT and the emergence of a new environmental movement. Um, fast forward a little bit here to get to... Get a little bio info. There we go. So Rachel Carson um, was also a lone female voice in a male-dominated profession, uh, which was frankly all the sciences after World War II. And she was uh, uh, also someone who had a journalism background, but she became one of the most successful science communicators ever. Uh, her book, Silent Spring from 1962, is arguably still the single most successful uh, piece of popular science ever written uh, in terms of the impact it had on the general public. Um, she grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania uh, she, uh, graduated from, uh, the Pennsylvania College for Women, a place now called Chatham College in 1929, um, and then, uh, embarked on what was then still a quite unusual career in the sciences for women in the 1920s and 1930s. In 1929, she studied at the Woods Hole Marine Biological Laboratory, which is a very prestigious research center and received a master's degree in zoology from Johns Hopkins University in 1932. Uh, she was already doing some journalism work and she got hired by the US Bureau of Fisheries to write radio scripts during the depression uh, and supplemented her income writing feature articles on natural history for the Baltimore Sun. And a little later in the 1930s, she began a 15 year career in the federal service as a scientist and editor and became editor-in-chief for all publications for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And again, this is in an era when often she was, frankly, kind of the only woman uh, in a lot of the workplaces she was in, a lot of the meetings she was in. Uh, the sciences were still overwhelmingly dominated by men uh, in that era. Uh, in this writing, she is sort of taking her specialized scientific knowledge and figuring out how to communicate it to the general public. And she does that for the government. Uh, and she will parlay that into uh, uh, the book she's going to write later. But before we dive into her writing and Silent Spring, let's take a minute just to sort of see where the environmental movement was before her in the same way that we were looking at urban redevelopment and renewal before Jane Jacobs. Let's take just a couple minutes to look at the environmental movement before Rachel Carson. So the older history of the U.S. environmental movement, um, which dates back really to the later 19th century in the United States, um, had primarily been focused on landscape preservation, uh, the creation of national parks, later, much later National Park Service, the creation of national forests and a national forest service, uh, setting aside landscapes that either were intended to be preserved, like Yosemite or Yellowstone, or national forests where you were going to regulate how natural resources were used uh, prior to the, prior to the sort of the earlier U.S. experience, which was use all the resources as fast as you can and then just move on somewhere else. So that earlier national that earlier environmental movement had some huge successes. Uh, preserving places like Yosemite and Yellowstone, uh, these spectacular landscapes that were preserved primarily for their aesthetic value, for their beauty. They weren't being preserved as, as, as intact ecosystems or they weren't really thinking about anything like that yet. Um, just a couple of these famous early preservationists and conservationists, John Muir, founder of the Sierra Club, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, who added, I think, 75 million acres to the National Forest System, appointed the first superintendent of the U.S. Forest Service, a guy named Gifford Pinchot, and also was given the power to create national monuments, and he used that to protect all kinds of places, including huge places like the Grand Canyon. So again, it was about preserving landscapes, and nature was something that was out there, big spectacular places you got in a car and went to see. 
Uh, and there's Teddy in full outdoor mode. Uh, this was the outfit he had designed at Brooks Brothers, true story, before he went out west to reinvent himself as a cowboy, as a young man, after growing up very wealthy in New York. So that environmental movement had some very real successes. It did all kinds of things. The first national parks in the world were created in the United States. But that environmental movement really saw nature, nature with a capital N, is somewhere spectacular out there, unconnected to us in a lot of ways. And our cities and houses, our daily life, how we consumed, uh, how the environment worked in our own lives and how our cities interacted with the environment. And it was largely dedicated to protecting wilderness as the Wilderness Act would say in 1964, places where man does not remain. The idea that nature is something separate from people and it was also definitely a movement dominated by men. Um, that's not to say women weren't in the movement. They certainly were, and they were important. But the the biggest voices, the most uh, uh, visible leaders in this movement were mostly male. So Rachel Carson, um, long before she worked for the federal government for the Fisheries and Wildlife Service, she was really interested in the ocean and in marine life. So she wrote two books about that, Under the Sea Wind, A Naturalist Picture of Ocean Life, and The Sea Around Us. Uh, these were very popular books. They get a lot of attention. Uh, they um, uh, allowed her to think about other writing projects. Uh, and The Sea Around Us won the National Book Award. And um, she gave us acceptance speech when the sea around us won that big award. And I think it's worth quoting uh, part of what she said. She said, many people have commented on the unusual fact that a work of science should have a large popular sale. But this notion that science is something that belongs in a separate compartment of its own, apart from everyday life, is something I would like to challenge. We live in a scientific age Yet we assume that knowledge is only the prerogative of a small number of human beings isolated and priest-like in their laboratories. And I think priest-like is not an accident because she's saying they're all men. Uh, this is not true. The materials of science are the materials of life itself. It is impossible to understand man without understanding his environment and the forces that have molded him physically and mentally. So like I said, she was most interested in marine life and writing about that. But she became very concerned when she started hearing stories about something that was supposed to be a miracle. And that miracle in the post-war era was DDT and other pesticides. Uh, these pesticides could protect crops, uh, they could eliminate mosquitoes and, you know, on the scale of things we worry about in terms of like sharks and tigers and mountain lions and things like that, mosquitoes have killed far more people than any of those big predators ever did with diseases like malaria uh, and other diseases that have stalked humans throughout history. So uh, these synthetic pesticides... Um, were uh, incredibly successful, but there were also these growing stories of problems with them, of uh, things that were happening uh, with, with these products. So just one example, a little more info on DDT, um, uh, use as a pesticide starting in the 1940s to combat malaria, typhus, other insect-borne human diseases. Um, so it's incredibly successful. It works incredibly well. There's just one big problem. Well, there's more than one problem, but one obvious problem that happens quickly is that insects very rapidly develop resistance to it. So you have to use more and more of this highly potent chemical to get the same result. And this means that lots of people are going to be using lots and lots of DDT all over the place. And it's going to start to have consequences. Um, she uh, uh, hears about some of these problems, uh, hears about some of the dangers of this uh, chemical and decides to write a book about it. That book is Silent Spring. It's published in 1962. 
Uh, Carson, unfortunately, was in very poor health by the time the book was released. She was suffering from breast cancer. Um, but despite that, she does a big publicity tour. She gets interviewed on CBS. She testifies before Congress. The book is a huge bestseller. And the book uh, uh, warns the general public, really for the first time, that maybe these synthetic pesticides have unintended consequences. So um, uh, she opens the book with this sort of lovely image. There was once a town in the heart of America that seemed to, seemed to live in harmony with its surroundings. It lay in the midst of a checkerboard of prosperous fields of grain and hillsides of orchards, so on and so forth. So it opens with a sort of beautiful scene of a town somewhere in the middle of America. And then she takes a turn into sort of gothic horror. Uh, she says, then a strange blight crept over the area and everything began to change. Some evil spell had settled on the community. Mysterious maladies swept the flocks of chickens. The cattle and sheep sickened and died. Everywhere was a shadow of death. The farmers spoke of much illness among their families. In town, the doctors had become more and more puzzled by new kinds of sickness appearing among their patients. Um, there was a strange stillness. The birds, for example, where had they gone? Many people spoke of them, puzzled and disturbed. The feeding stations in the backyards were deserted. The few birds seen anywhere were moribund. They trembled violently, could not fly. It was a spring without voices. And this, of course, is where the title for her book comes from. Um, and she goes on to say, no witchcraft, no enemy action had silenced all the new life in the stricken world. Uh, the people had done it themselves. So that's the opening to the book. So she's grabbing readers with this alarming depiction. Um, she then describes how she's combining a bunch of stories together, though this town does not actually exist, but it has a thousand counterparts in America or elsewhere. Every one of these uh, events happened somewhere and many rural communities suffered a substantial number of them. What has already silenced the voices of spring uh, in towns in America? This book is an attempt to explain. So then she follows that up with chapters that look at the impact of DDT on human health, uh, DDT in the environment, especially DDT in birds and in ecosystems and food chains, uh, looking at the interconnectedness of all these different animals and plants and species and people in a way that, that may not seem surprising to us in 2024, but was in 1962. Um, Lots of people would criticize her book. The petrochemical industry had a freak out about her book. Um, and we're going to see some examples of that in just a minute. But the biggest critique that was aimed at Rachel Carson and that you still hear sometimes today is that she was saying that pesticides should never be used. And because she said pesticides should never be used, she was responsible for a big increase in malaria cases or something like that. And that is not true. Uh, right here on page 12 of her book, she says, it is not my contention that chemical pesticides must never be used. I do contend that we put poisons and biologically potent chemicals indiscriminately into the hands of persons largely or wholly ignorant of their potentials for harm. We've subjected enormous numbers of people to contact with these poisons without their consent and often without their knowledge. If the Bill of Rights contains no guarantee that a citizen shall be secure against lethal poisons distributed either by private individuals or by public officials, it is surely only because our forefathers, despite their considerable wisdom and formidable and uh, foresight, could conceive of no such problem. So she's saying that, yeah, of course we can use pesticides, but we're pumping huge amounts of this stuff into the environment, into communities where people don't know how dangerous they are. They're being deployed by people who don't understand how dangerous they are. We're having to use more and more of them to get the same effect. Um, and that is extremely dangerous. And so I mean, example is the national bird, the, the bald eagle. 
uh, the bald eagle almost went extinct because of DDT uh, in the environment. So uh, bald eagles are predators. They eat lots of fish, among other things. And DDT was accumulating in the fatty tissues of fish. Um, eagles would eat this fish laced with DDT. They would have health problems. And most famously or infamously, uh, when female eagles laid eggs, uh, the DDT had so profoundly affected their health that the eggshells weren't normal. They were too thin and too brittle. And the moment the eagle sat on the eggs, they would crack. Um, so you have this, you know, near extinction of this iconic animal. And it's sort of like in the late 19th century when the bison almost went extinct. And for the first time, a lot of Americans thought, wow, that's really bad. Uh, this is an iconic American animal. We don't want it to go extinct. Uh, some sport hunters and early conservationists hashed a plan to try to save the bison. And here now in the 1960s, again, this really famous animal is about to go extinct because of human actions. Um, just some example of the pushback she got. Uh, Silent Spring is now a noisy summer. Pesticides industry up in arms over her new book. Um, uh, just some examples. Uh, one preparation sued to pre present, prevent publication of the book. Uh, chemical and pesticide corporations condemned her, her, her as, and I quote, a hysterical woman and asserted that women were overly emotional and simply incapable of understanding complex scientific issues. Uh, the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture asserted that, and I quote, since she is unmarried but attractive, she must be a communist. Not sure how that works. Um, and there was this concern that this would somehow lead to weakness in the Cold War, that it would it would allow the Soviets to get ahead of us. Um, and even today, you occasionally encounter people who say, well, she uh, uh, increased numbers of deaths from malaria uh, by her demonization of DDT, even though, as I've just read you, Carson stated in her book that pesticides should be used judiciously if you're having an epidemic sure, use it, but don't just spray it all over everything all the time. As they were doing in this era, it's being sprayed on all the crops, it's being sprayed from airplanes, it's being sprayed from trucks. I remember those even from my own childhood. Um, so all the stuff is being sprayed in the environment with consequences. Um, but Silent Spring really triumphed over its critics. It's one of the most successful nonfiction books in American history and the most successful science book in American history. Uh, she died of breast cancer only 18 months after it was published, but her work, uh, her testimony about TDT uh, led to its banning in the U.S. in 1972. It's still used internationally, especially in epidemic uh, cases. in 1970. Um, and this newfound awareness that human pollutants didn't just go out into nature, they came back to us. There's increasing concern about things like, for example, detergent showing up in suburban water systems because it was leaching out of septic tanks and into local water supplies. That is not a glass of beer. That's tap water with detergent in it. Um, uh, so, like I said, DDT gets banned in the United States. The country is now banned for all uses except for malaria control. So it's still being used for that. Um, and I think looking at Rachel Carson today uh, in the 21st century, she brought scientific knowledge and environmental awareness to a broad public in an engaging, readable, and compelling form. Uh, and she represented a pushback against sort of this and that critique would show up again. Uh, her work uh, 
uh, led us towards environmentalism that moved away from a conceptualization of nature apart from humans to one where humans are part of nature and that we are in this interconnected web with everything else. So that's Rachel Carson. Um, more briefly, uh, I'm also going to talk about Betty Friedan and her critique of the place of women in the post-war order. Um, she publishes a book that arguably is more controversial even than the other two, a book called The Feminine... She um, there we go. Um, so, what's the story of Betty Friedan? Uh, she represented, in many ways sort of the apex of the socioeconomic structure structure in post-war America. Um, you're having a lot of trouble. Yeah. Um, Lawrence, I think we've lost you. Can everybody hear me now? Yeah. Um, yes. so it's, it's not a problem with the zoom. It's, it's a problem at Lawrence's end, I think. Uh, Rosemary, are you still there? Yeah, you're muted. Um, you think I ought to try calling him? I don't know. Oh, he's back on now. I don't know what happened. Yeah, Lawrence, we, we lost you there. Yeah, I know. It just cut off. The Zoom Wait, turned what, off. Well, it, it, it seems to have been at your end. Nobody else had a problem at our end. Weird. Uh, you want to just back up to the beginning of Betty Ferdan? Sure, sure. Because well, that's, uh, where, that's where you went off right there. Okay, yeah. all right. Sorry about that. Yeah, I don't know. Sometimes Zoom just decides it can't take anymore and it <laughs> turns off. Maybe that's maybe it was just saying it's time to wrap up. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I'll I'll go back and talk just a little bit about um Betty for Dan. And so I'll share my screen again. Hopefully that won't freak it out too much. Let's see. All right. Can you still see and hear me? Yes, yes. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so anyway, Betty Friedan uh, uh, writes this book that she was not expecting to write. Um, she had graduated from Smith College, which was one of the very elite uh, women's colleges founded by the Ivy League schools before they would admit women. Uh, she's writing, uh, she was asked to gather responses from her alumni class at Smith College 15 years after they had graduated from school. And she got the survey results and she was shocked by what they said. What they said was that a lot of her classmates who on paper were at the apex of American life in terms of socioeconomic success, these were people often from wealthy families, they had married well, they lived in nice houses, they had kids, they had husbands who had very successful careers, but they sure weren't very happy. And so at first she thought about writing an article about that, and then she wrote a whole book about it. And that book is called The Feminine Mystique. Um, it became one of the best-selling uh, uh, nonfiction books of all time. Um, and it begins with an introduction describing what Friedan called the problem with no name, the widespread unhappiness of women in the 1950s and early 1960s. So she takes the survey results from Smith and then she did a bunch of other surveys and interviewed other women who said they weren't very happy. Um, uh, despite living in material comfort, despite being married with children and in many ways being happy with, with those aspects of their lives, still not being happy overall. 
Um, she argued that these women had sort of been pushed into one particular way of being, one particular trajectory for their lives, and not really given the option of any others, and that this was a core reason why they weren't happy. So this is Betty Fernand, uh, who died in 2006. Um, and that's the book, The Feminine Mystique. Uh, I'll just read a couple of quotes from it. Um, uh, let me see here. Is there another page I got to? The problem lay buried, unspoken for many years in the minds of American women. It was a strange stirring, a sense of dissatisfaction, a yearning that women suffered in the middle of the 20th century in the United States. Each suburban wife struggled with it alone as she made the beds, shopped for groceries, matched slipcover material, ate peanut butter sandwiches with her children, chauffeured Cub Scouts and brownies, lay beside her husband at night. She was afraid to even ask herself the silent question, is this all? Um, for over 15 years, there was no word of this yearning in the millions of words written about women for women in all the columns, books, and articles by experts telling women their role was to seek fulfillment as wives and mothers. Um, and uh, they learned, I'm fast forward here, they learned that truly feminine women did not want careers, higher education, political rights, the independence and the opportunities that the old fashioned feminists had fought for. So remember, these are women in the 1950s, 1960s, who are another lifetime after the original struggle for women's rights, which starts in 1848 with the Declaration for Sentiments at Seneca Falls, the demand for equal rights for women, the right to vote, the right to own property, the right to own businesses, the right to go to university, the right to practice in the professions. It takes a whole human lifetime all the way to 1920 just to get the right to vote. And then in the intervening decades, women gradually got access to higher ed, got access to the professions in the 1920s are increasingly visible in public life and increasingly have their own careers and their own income. In the 1930s, women did all kinds of work during the Great Depression. In the 1940s, they did heavy industrial labor during World War II. So they're doing all of that. They're finally getting access to higher ed. They're finally getting access to professions. And then the 1950s, come screeching in and the culture seems to say, no, you shouldn't do any of that. You shouldn't want any of that. Here's the one way you can be. And Betty Friedan was not uh, uh, saying that women shouldn't want to be housewives or mothers or anything like that. She was saying that they should have the option to be whatever they wanted, to pursue whatever kind of life they wanted, not just one kind of life. So in that sense, her critique um, uh, is specific, of course, to this one subset of women, frankly, fairly affluent uh, women in the post-war era, but it's this much larger question of the role of women in society and the options they had or didn't have. And though her focus is specifically on women and is going to lead to sort of the new feminist movements of the 1960s and the 1970s, the failed Equal Rights Amendment, uh, the legalization of abortion, which of course is is still dominating our politics now in 2024. Um, so she she sort of leads into this new what we would call second wave feminism of the 1960s and 1970s. Um, but also like these other women, even though Jane Jacobs was talking about cities, Rachel Carson was talking about the environment. All three of these women. We're looking at a world dominated by men, where men control the professions, men control politics, and saying, maybe uh, the post-war world you have created isn't exactly perfect, and maybe even not all that great for a whole lot of people. Uh, so that's how these three very different women uh, uh, and their uh, critiques um, connect to each other, connect to this longer, older women's movement and connect also to where that women's movement is going in the future. Um, and as I think even today, uh, the, all three of those books are very fascinating reads and very interesting takes on um, not just women in American life, 
but the whole sort of question of how we organize our society and what our priorities are and what we are concerned about. And all three of these authors spoke very eloquently to that. And with that, I will wrap up and uh, uh, I guess I can leave the screen share on for the moment if anybody wants to ask about any slides or anything. But otherwise, I'd be very happy to, um, to take any questions anybody has. And uh, be sure to unmute yourself uh, before you speak. Um, I can't read lips, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there are times nowadays where these criticisms are made of the old white men. One question I have is, do you think it was um, a conscious um, antipathy towards women or just uh, uh, a gross unawareness. I I, I never thought of <clears throat> men as particularly going, um, trying to hold women down, <clears throat> although I guess they have, but um, I, I'm curious as to whether it was really a conscious effort or if it was just an, an assumption that the current norms of the times were perfectly all right or or whether it was just a, a lack of awareness uh, lawrence are you still with us he's disappeared yeah i think we lost him here for a minute um Andy, yeah, I think the books were written by women, these important books, in large part because it was a man's world and the men didn't really think about these issues as they, very much. I mean, it was their world. It was our world, if you will. And uh, uh, I, I, women were were affected by it and it, it, it clearly... Uh, or they were more observant, which women are in general, uh, I might say. In the case of, of New York's planning, Robert Moses, uh, he was very definitely uh, not in favor of the lower classes. And the roads that he built were made in such a way that uh, people who traveled by bus couldn't get off the highways very easily. Uh, and uh, he would have had a freeway running right through the center of New York City. Uh, there was a very interesting book about him and his power. And the, nobody questioned it, really, uh, at least publicly. Uh, whereas Jane Jacobs, who was a very observant person, called him out on it. And I think that's part of the reason that these books are written by women. Just a just a thought. Are you Lawrence, Lawrence says he's trying to get back on. His Zoom just quit, and he's having to log on again. I don't know what keeps happening from his end. Well, you know, look, just another observation. Look at what the Taliban are doing to women over there in Afghanistan. I mean, it's 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 a fear of of losing control, don't you think? Don't you think that's why men do what they do <laughs> throughout history? You can just see it in in every example uh, um, of the Roman civilization. On and and then there was then there were women like Cleopatra that totally dominated for a while in Egypt. Where did she come from? How did she do that? You know? <laughs> um. I would love to give a couple of personal examples. In the 1970s, I had an insurance salesman hang up on me because my husband wasn't home and he could only talk to my husband. And I tried to buy a car from a car dealer in the town where I lived, and he would not let me buy a car without talking to my husband. Needless to say, he didn't sell me a car, and neither did the insurance salesman sell us any insurance. 
uh, what about the the biblical right that think women's place is in the kitchen and some think in the stove? <laughs> <laughs> Larry, when you're a, talking about on a different uh, subject, I had a call during the session that Betty Ratliff has passed away. Oh, oh, oh! So sorry to hear that. Yeah, and I know have just one word to to mention about the importance and power of women, and that is Lysistrata. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh yeah. Of, I've got a question for Lawrence. You can, we'll keep reading today. Oh, you muted. Okay, I'm yeah. back for now. Apparently, my internet actually went out. I was in a Zoom meeting for three hours yesterday. I've been perfectly happy if my Zoom had died yesterday. <laughs> I, no. Right. The, question <laughs> I, the question I have is: today, you keep reading about. Uh, young boys and men in college that the it's being overtaken by the women and what's going to happen to the men of the future are, mm -hmm. are you experiencing that amongst your students it's certainly true that that in terms of college attendance and graduation rates women are doing much better much better than they used to in the old days when they didn't have access to any of those things wow. and in the last couple of decades they have to some degree outpaced male students in terms of graduation rates and attendance um I I think it's an interesting question how much of that is about male students specifically and how much of that may speak to other issues like our K through 12 education system the unaffordability of college which is a whole different problem um and people not necessarily believing that a college education is worth it in terms of the cost especially in states where it's really expensive um on paper, I think if you do the demographic, if you run the demographic tables, it's still definitely worth it, both in terms of earnings and in terms of even lifetime health outcomes. But uh, there has been this definite drop off in in the number of young men coming to college. And so what are what are all the reasons for that? Um, and how can we address it and better address all students, of course? I think one reason is there are more jobs available to men without college education, and women believe that they can't make it without a college education. I think, well, and I think especially when you think about jobs that are male coded, like construction, right. or right. or you know, in my in in the world I live here in Utah, we see enrollment dip when there's an oil boom, for example, because a lot of our students are from rural places where the oil and gas industry is big. Right. And they they can get good paying work where they don't need a college degree. And then when it dips again, they come back to college. Uh, so you do certainly see a correlation there. Well, you also see more women now in uh, executive high executive positions in uh, uh, in in our medical school. They occupy um, probably more than fifty percent of the departmental chairs. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very well organized in the sense that there are women's support groups uh, that are very helpful to women and help and give them advice on how to proceed. Uh, men don't have that. They really don't have that very much. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, being part of the previously dominant group, they take for granted. They must be taking it for granted. They don't see themselves mm -hmm. as in a competitive position. Yeah, it's well, just of course like, is a huge change from the way it was, uh, yeah, fifty or sixty years ago. Yeah. One thing I've noticed is that when women enter a profession or job in great numbers, the pay for that profession goes down. Yep. For everyone, male and female. The ultimate example of that is is I mean historically was uh, the first industrial workers in the United States in the textile mills of New England, where they turned all that slave-grown cotton into cloth, and it was the nation's biggest export. Uh, those textile mills employed women because they could be paid half of what men were paid. The rationale being that uh, women only worked temporarily, they would all leave the workforce to marry and have children, whereas men were heads of households, so you had to pay them more. <laughs> 
Uh, and that lasted from the 1820s, 1830s, into the 1840s. And then those American-born women were forced out by an even cheaper labor force, which were all the new and deeply desperate immigrants from Ireland uh, during the potato famine. So, you know, labor, labor an, capital is always going to figure out how to lower its labor costs. There's an article in the Wall Street Journal today about women leaving Goldman Sachs because of the glass ceiling. Hmm. That's interesting. Well, I, I think, you know, it's it's interesting to think about how there's been an incredible amount of success in some regards <laughs> and less so in others. Uh, I mean, it's hard to imagine, but I mean, one statistic uh, is when um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg finished law school, and I don't know what year that was, when she finished law school, there was not a single law firm in New York City that would hire her because she was a woman and they just didn't hire any women. Um, so, uh, uh, and some professions are still much more male than female. And that I think most obviously is, is usually associated with the sciences and engineering, but it's also true, especially until quite recently in our politics, um, that was still overwhelmingly male. That's somewhat less true today. Um, but it's still uh, more male than not. So I, I think it's a it's a a mixed um, a mixed set of circumstances, and of course it also depends on other things too. Like if you are lucky enough to grow up in a family with some resources and go to a good school system, then you have more options, whether you're male or female, um, than if you don't. Um, and, uh, you know, that dictates a lot of things beyond gender, of course, and there's race and all sorts of other factors as well, of course. Well, Lawrence, this was a great discussion. Uh, I think we about run the course. Maybe one more question. Anybody have one more? No. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, and I'm sorry. I, I zoomed in and out, <laughs> but I enjoyed speaking with you. Thanks. Yeah. Excellent, very excellent, excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. I appreciate it. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Yep. Okay. See you all next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>